Is it day or night? We really haven't determined that yet. We're waiting to see what happens with the volunteers. So, yeah, it's, uh, they haven't decided whether it's daytime or nighttime, but um, if, you, uh, if you really want to do it, let them know what you can do, and, and they'll, uh, they'll figure it out. All right, so let's turn to John 12. We're reading 27 through 36. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may, may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. All right. And I have one more thing. Um, this is actually how I came to get up here for announcements. Is uh, I asked if I could do a minute with missions this morning. So, <laughs> so you may have, uh, you may remember, and you may not, because it's been um, a long time that we were going to start doing minute with missions more regularly. Um, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> let's. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, Camp Berea. Um, it's a ministry we support. Um, some of us are. Our, our, I'm sure a lot of us are, are familiar with it. With it. Um, I was a counselor there for a couple of summers. Um, and um, it's just a, it's a great, it's a youth camp in Turner and um, it has capacity for, on a normal year, has capacity for 50 campers, I believe, um, unless they've changed things in the, in the time it's been, I'm getting older, so it's been a little while since I was there. But um, so they weren't able to have a normal year this year, as you may have guessed. Um, but they did have camper days. So they, the kids could go there um, during the day. And um, so I'll just I'll read a quick little thing here. My granddaughters attended for several, several of the camper days. I was just totally impressed by the entire staff, counselors, kitchen staff, leaders, etc. The dedication of the entire group was incredible. The campers were engaged for the entire day and had a nice balance of games, Bible lessons, challenges, and wonderful fellowship. The entire experience for my granddaughters was great. If they had to step on the scales at the end of the day, they probably wouldn't have registered even a pound. And then uh, the writer of the letter is Wayne Farrington, the board president. He says, many others shared the same kind of uplifting um, given to their teens who attended these days in the summer 2020 camper days. And um, so, uh, yeah, let's just pray and thank God for uh, ministries like this that we can, we can be a small part of. Um, dear God, I thank you that um, uh, that we as a church can, uh, can give um, to ministries such as this, such as Camp Berea, Lord. Thank you that, um, uh, that work is being done in the lives of uh, the youth in our area uh, through the camp. And I just pray that you are with the staff and with the, um, uh, everyone involved with the camp, that you would give them patience and you, know, you would help them. Um, and thank you that they were able to reach uh, some of the some of the youth that they would have. Um, thank you for thank you for always uh, showing a way, um, and thank you for using us uh, even when we don't see a way. And God, I just I just uh, thank you again that we can be a part of it. Thank you for what you're doing um, right here in Maine, and um, help us to be a part of of how you're moving. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Great to have a pretty full house this morning. Uh, for those who are watching through the Facebook live stream, we've got at least 40 or 50 people here this morning. And I heard that people were kind of happy that it's the first day of spring. You can get some hoo hoo hoo. It's been a long winter, but really not bad compared to the winters we've had in the past. I was uh, speaking of the first day of spring, I was kind of looking for something to talk about, and I checked the national day calendar, because I don't know if you know, but there's a day, there's a day for everything throughout the year that they dedicate, sort of, some of them are like hallmark days. Um, today is National Fragrance Day, <laughs> National Common Courtesy Day, that's a good thing, and uh, National French Bread Day. <laughs> Which doesn't make sense because I thought uh, Wednesday was spaghetti day, so why would you have the bread that you have with the spaghetti on Sunday? <laughs> so I don't know. But uh, uh, putting aside the, the humor, um, it's actually National Single Parent Day. And uh, one of the radio stations I listened to was promoting that, and I, it kind of made me do some research on it. And it's, it's to honor the mothers and fathers that are raising children alone. And uh, all of us must know some single parents or have been one or been raised by one. I know when I was a teenager, uh, my dad took care of the four kids, and that, I'm dating myself here, but that's when Crock-Pots came out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the electric ones. And uh, he used to make dinner the night before, so when he came home from work and all the kids came home from school, we could have dinner together. And that's just a small example, but um, in, your, in your travels today, if you come across any single parents, um, uh, pray for them and, and encourage them so they can raise healthy and happy kids. Um, there's also a, uh, a group that is promoting this called the Solo Parent Society, so you can check that out sometime. But um, let's get started with our worship service. Won't you please join us? <laughs>
right. Gets the blood flowing a little bit. It was a little chilly coming in this morning, but let's have a word of prayer before our next song. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful spring day and for always being there for us. Through your grace and mercy and the sacrifice of your holy son, you give us hope in the forgiveness of our sins. Please continue to guide us and help us focus on the sermon this, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so it was St. Patrick's Day this weekend, so we thought we would introduce a traditional Irish hymn today. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It is very old. It is, um, the lyrics are somewhere between the year 600 and 800 AD. So these lyrics are closer to Jesus than we have lived. <laughs> um, <clears throat> In case you're wondering, St. Patrick was not a leprechaun. St. Patrick was a person. <laughs> um, he was an early church leader that lived even before this song was written, somewhere around 300s, 400s AD. Um, <clears throat> and I thought I would read something he wrote because I found it. I, I just love reading from, from Patrick here. He says, uh, God, my God, omnipotent king, I humbly adore thee. Thou art king of kings, lord of lords. Thou art the judge of every age. Thou art redeemer of souls. Thou art the liberator of those who believe. Thou art the hope of those who toil. Thou art the comforter of those in sorrow. Thou art the way to those who wander. Thou art the master to the nations. Thou art the creator of all creatures. Thou art the lover of all good. Thou art the prince of all virtue, the joy of all thy saints. Thou art life perpetual. Thou art joy in truth. Thou art the exaltation in the eternal fatherland. Thou art the light of light. Thou art the fountain of holiness. Thou art the glory of God the Father in the height, thou art the Savior of the world. That's a lot that God is. There's a lot to think about. And what I love about this song is that it reminds us to stay centered and to stay focused on who God is, to remain the center of our vision. And there's so many ways that we can focus on him like that today. So I'm looking forward to this, guys. It's going to be good.
I set the water down there so that I can kick it over. That's, that's why we do things, right? There's a purpose for everything. Good morning, everyone. It's good, to, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. Good to see some guests and visitors of people that we haven't seen for a while. Um, I'm thankful to, to God that we can be here this morning. Um, we had read a scripture reading this morning from John chapter 12. That's not where I'm going to be speaking from this morning. This morning we're going to be speaking from John chapter 8. But I wanted to use what was in 12 um, to kind of draw us in a little bit because there's, there's a, some very similarity between 8 and 12. And some of the things that Jesus said in 12 are effectively repeats of what he says in 8. Um, and just trying to draw the, the, collect, the connection there. Um, I'm tempted to pull this mask up further and just cover my eyes too, but... I don't know if I would look better. No way, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I was going to say you would. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> good point. <laughs> one thing I mentioned to, to the guys this morning in preparation is wanting to stay focused this morning because there's an awful lot that takes place here in the book of, of well, in John in, in a general sense, but in chapter 8. But I want us to, to keep in mind where we're at as we go through John. One thing that was commented a few weeks ago, I think we were in chapter 6 at the time, I forget exactly where, but keeping track of where we are in Jesus' life and what he's doing, what he's prepared, what he's, where he's been, where he's going. Really more important, where he's going. It's going to come out repeatedly through what we look at this morning in chapter 8. I'm going to, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 29 of chapter 8, so I'll give you time to get there. It was commented several weeks ago, and again, I think it was chapter 6 we were looking at, that realizing that Jesus has basically three and a half years of ministry here on earth. We're already in the last six months of that three and a half years at this point in John. So there's 16 chapters in John. We're not even halfway through John, but we're well, well over halfway through his ministry. And what we, I want to keep in mind is where his focus is at this point. Jesus is already looking at the cross. He's already preparing for that event that is coming. He knows it's coming because nobody else does. We have the hindsight of 2,000 years of history to look back at and say, well, clearly this is what, was, what he was doing. The world around him doesn't see that, but we can see when we read it the focus of Jesus, the focus of why he's here and knowing why he's here. And that's going to come out repeatedly through what we look at this morning, that the focus is the cross and what's going to happen there and the, and the penalty of the sins of the world being paid for by Jesus at that point, and he knows what's coming. So as we think about that, as we prepare for that in thought, let's have a word of prayer as we, as we get going. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic are thy ways. Father, we come here this morning aware of the, the warmer weather outside and the promise of spring and the, the newness of life that comes with that. And, and I think that and Easter can be a, a thing for, for, us, for Christians to... You know, excite us about the, about the year that we're in. And we look back at this past year and maybe have a lot of regrets of how things went and, and concerns about, about the future. But help us this morning to focus not on those things of the world that are, that are transitory, um, but to focus on what is real and what is true and what is important. Lord, as we read your word, may your spirit work in us, teach us, direct us, guide us. Help us to know you better this morning, Lord. Help us to know ourselves better this morning. Lord, we commit this time to you and ask for your, your spirit's leading. In Jesus' name, amen. John clearly has some things that he wants us to understand about Jesus. And it's clear as we go through John from the beginning to the end, the emphasis on Jesus as God. And that'll come out clearly again in some of the things we'll look at this morning. So we're in John chapter 8. Beginning with verse 12. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Um, there are seven I am statements like this that, that, that we look at throughout the book of John. Um, some will argue eight, but we'll, we'll talk about, the, about that in just a moment. We already looked at one of them in chapter 6 where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We spent some time there. Here in chapter 8, we see I am the light of the world. Uh, in chapter 10, we're going to look at um, Jesus has, saying, I am the door. And then later, I am the good shepherd. Um, in chapter 11, we have the resurrection and the life. 
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, I am the vine. And some will argue that there are actually eight I am statements because there's the, the greatest one, really, that, that, all, that encompasses all these others that we'll also find in, the, in, the, in chapter 8, but we're not going to get there this morning, where Jesus simply says, before Abraham was, I am. That clear picture of him as the eternal God that, co- that existed before Abraham and exists today and exists for all, eter- all, all, all eternity. But in particular, this time right now, he's, uh, we're looking at the, the one where he says, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> I like the light. Um, light dispels darkness. It's never the other way around. Have you ever walked into a, a, a lighted room and the darkness just makes the light go away? No, but you walk into a dark room and you flick a light on or something and the darkness goes away. Light always repels darkness. It's never the other way around. Light reveals things, reveals everything. In um, Mark 4.22, it says, For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it should come to light. And light also causes life to flourish. We look at the world around us, and in the wintertime in Maine, we don't think of much about the life outside, but actually, I look out there and I see those green pine trees, and I know that they're still alive. Even those trees that don't have the leaves out are still alive. But... The light is what we we long for, these bright days and the sun shining, the leaves coming out and the life that comes with that. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I recognize that life refers to this idea of of causing life to flourish. So he says, he who follows me. Um, Again, looking at that idea of light dispelling. It dispels the darkness so we can see the fact that Jesus is moving. You don't follow a statue. You follow somebody who is moving, who is active. And, and, and to follow Jesus in, re, re, involves activity, involves movement, involves seeing what he's doing and then and going in that same place. In Luke 22, verse 69, in Jesus referring to what's going to come in the future, he says that um, you will see me sitting at the right hand of the Father. And sometimes we have that picture of Jesus, you, here's God sitting on a throne and then Jesus sitting at his right hand. But that speaks more of God's position as opposed to his location. His position of the the right hand, the power of of God. But his position, excuse me, his location is not sitting in some throne somewhere off in heaven. Where is Jesus today? Physically, his body, I mean, I I don't know where he is. We'll we'll say heaven. But his spirit, the the spirit of God is active and, and Jesus is active in the world around us to reach the hearts and lives of people, to draw them to himself because he wants the world to know as we look here in, in verse 12, in chapter 8, where he's going to the cross where he will die for the salvation of the world. He's actively involved in the world today, showing them that, t- um, preparing them for that. And he uses us as his hands and his feet of, um, to help him achieve that goal. So he's the light of the world. And if we follow him, then we see the revealed darkness. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the light dispels the darkness and then we can follow Jesus. Um, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness. Not walk in darkness. Why do I not walk in darkness when I'm following God, following Jesus? Because he's the light. So when I'm following the light, I don't worry about stumbling on the, on the path in front of me. Um, I tried to do a yearly hike with the, the family. and We've gone up to a Katahdin area. It's not always Mount Katahdin. Actually, a couple of times we got rained out and never made it all the way up. But one of the things you're supposed to do on a hike like that is carry a flashlight with you. And you say, why do I need a flashlight? I'm going up in the day. I'm coming down in the day. Well, that's the plan. You don't want to walk one of those trails in the dark. Um, Jesus is the light of the world. When I have Jesus in my, as, my, as my light, I'm never stumbling over the things that I can't see because he's providing the light. He reveals all those things that we can stumble over. I am the light of the world. Do not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. Um, Light, brightness. We think of light as drawing people, um, something being bright, it draws attention. Jesus is the light of the world. He draws attention to himself. Light kind of speaks of cleanliness too. It exposes the dirt and typically we clean it if we see that it's dirty. But even the brightness of light, we think of it using light to kill bacteria. That, that light is, is that which kills the bad and causes the good to flourish. 
And we also use that expression of light um, as understanding. I understand something. Ah, I see the light. Jesus is our understanding of the world. In Proverbs 1, 7, it says, for the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. I can't have proper understanding of what's going on in the world around me, even from a scientific perspective, if I ignore the existence of God. It's that understanding of God, it's that fear of God that allows me to then understand properly even the physical world around me. But then later in Proverbs, it takes the next step further. It says, for the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I want to be a wise person. I want to have understanding of the, of the nature of what's going on around me. Then Jesus is the one that provides that. The fear of God, that understanding of Jesus is what provides that understanding of the world around me. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. We're going to try to get through, uh, through to verse 30 here. We'll, let's, we'll move along here. But there's so much just an idea of light. We do have to be careful sometimes when we use an, an analogy to not try to misapply the analogy. When Jesus says, I am a door, you don't ask the question, well, see, is he a solid door or a hollow core? That's not the idea. So you know, we can take the analogy too far, but sometimes the analogy, when you, you, know, when you dwell on it and you think about it and you realize just the depth of what Jesus said in one simple thing like that, I am the light of the world. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Now, my translation says true. It could easily have been translated valid. Your, your testimony, your witness is not valid. Um, they could be just saying, you know, you're just speaking words. They don't mean anything. Prove it. Um, I, I'm not going to believe you just because you say uh, this one thing. I think the emphasis really should be the question, is it true? Not, well, you're just one person saying something. Is what Jesus is saying true? I think that's a, an approach that we should all take in when we look at the things that we see and hear around us. Uh, Facebook is so full of things that are not true um, that people are led sway by falsehood because we don't ask that fundamental question, is it true? Here the Pharisees don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. But they're not asking the question, is it true? They're simply looking for a reason not to believe. Well, you're just one person saying something. Um, I'd ask the question is, is it okay to question when, when God says something? Um, you know, at some level, we want to say no. You know, when God said it, it's true, period. But, but there's room for us to kind of like, okay, I think God said something, and I want to understand if he did say that. Um, but here the Pharisees aren't trying to understand. Is, is what he's saying true? They just say, you know, you're just one man speaking. Your words don't mean anything. Prove it. They simply declare him to not be true. Your words are not valid. They don't mean anything. Jesus, said, Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from or where I am going. I, I like this verse. Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. God's word is true regardless. It is always true. God is singularly true. I need nothing else to, do, to prove God's word. So when Jesus claims um, a claim like this, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. It is valid because the only way he could say that, the only way he can say that my, my words are valid is if he's saying my words are the words of God. That's another picture, what we see here, that, of Jesus making that clear statement, I am God. I am the Father. I am the, fa I am the Father are one. It's clearly pictured throughout the book of John, not just in those seven I am statements that we looked at. Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from. Where did he come from? The Father. He came from God. He knows where he came from. They don't know where he came from. He knows where he's going. Where is he going? Ultimately, back to God. But there's a process first. He's going to the cross, to die on the cross, so that everybody will have that opportunity to then get to the Father. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You don't know God. 
Because if you knew God, you would know me. And we'll see that as we move into the verses that follow. In verse 15, he says, You people judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. It's a, a neat statement right there. Um, we judge according to, the, according to the flesh. You people, people in general, humankind, mankind, we judge according to the flesh. We, only, we judge by what we see and hear, by what we know. There's nothing that we can do beyond that. We have to be careful that we don't assume things beyond that because all I can know is what I see and hear. God's judgment comes from absolute knowledge. Mine comes from limited knowledge. I can see something, I can hear something, and I can still be wrong and not understand it properly. God's word is always true. He doesn't have to understand something. It's always true. But in reference to the, to the religious leaders, Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. I am not judging. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I and he who sent me. Again, that clear picture that, that God's judgment goes beyond just the knowledge of what he sees and hears. His judgment is true. Because his judgment is the judgment that comes from God directly. We have limited knowledge. And we, we act according to that limited knowledge. And, and within some degree, we have to. Um, we, live, we live our life, we make decisions, and, we, and we, um, you know, whether it's where we work or, or where we're, what house we're going to buy, where we're going to live, who we're going to marry, all those things that we do. We make decisions with the, the knowledge that we have. We seek for God's guidance for those things that we don't know, but we still make decisions on what we do know. Unfortunately, mankind has a tendency to say, well, I make these decisions on what I do know, and therefore what I, what I, the decision I made is true and right, and we assume beyond our understanding. Um, this whole concept of relative truth kind of comes into play from philosophers recognizing that nobody has all knowledge. So I make my decisions based on what I do know, and then I accept that to be as true, and I move forward. At some level, we have to do that, but as a Christian, we have to understand that my judgment can be wrong. I don't know everything. I may think I know a lot. I may make a, an assumption and a judgment, but my judgment can be false and wrong. Jesus said, even if I do judge, and he said, I didn't come to judge. Not yet. His judgment is later. He's going to judge. But that's not why he's here now. Why, why is he here now? He's leading to the cross. Not in judgment, but in redemption. But his judgment will come. And he says in verse 16, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. When the time for judgment comes, the judgments that, that Jesus makes will always be true because they're based on complete knowledge, unlike us humans, unlike us people who only judge by what we know and limited understanding. In verse 26, kind of jumping ahead, he said, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. There is a time coming when the judgment will come. And there's many things that Jesus has to say and, and to, uh, about them and judgment to them. But that's not what he's here for now. That's not where he's going right now. His eyes are focused on the cross. He's looking to, the, to where he's going. And that cross is not in judgment. That cross is in redemption and forgiveness of sins. Um, they made reference to God being the judge. We already read a couple of weeks ago in John 5, 22, um, where he says all judgment has been given to him by God. So, so Jesus is ultimately going to be the judge. Imagine if all he did was judge. What would he have said to the, to the Pharisees if all his actions were just about judgment? Um, I am so thankful for the mercies of God that, that causes him to not judge me on the spot every time I do something wrong. That his judgments are withheld because of his mercy, because of his love. And even in the midst of a nation that is rejecting him, that doesn't want anything to do with him, it's love that's driving his actions. It's mercy on these people that's driving his actions. And that cross that he's going to is, in, is out of love and mercy, um, not out of judgment. Again, verse 16, but even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone in it but I and he who sent me. 
Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true or valid. Is another word we could use there. It is interesting that he says in, in your law, he doesn't say in, in, in my law. Um, the, the Jews did add a lot of things to the law, but the law does, in, in, um, in the Old Testament, it does make reference to the fact that, that, that you know, two witnesses is what's needed, two or three witnesses, in order to, to determine something to be true, to be valid, to be right. Um, and Jesus is acknowledging that, or, or pointing out that to them, that even in your law, even in the law, I only need two witnesses to prove something to be true. Even in your law, verse 17, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. So we can make a truth claim based on, on two people. Now we know, all of us know, that, that it is possible to get a whole bunch of people to lie about something. So just because two people claim something to be true doesn't make it true. But recognizing that at some level, um, we, we understand people to, if, if they're trying to be honest, if they're trying to tell me what happened, if I have two people that are saying the same thing, we can recognize, okay, probably that's what, that's what really happened. Um, that's, not, that's not trying to say that anytime two people agree on something, it's true. That doesn't make it true, but that it helps put some credence on it. Um, but Jesus goes on to say in verse 18, I am he who bears witness of myself. I am one. I am making a statement so my statement, um, I am one person who's making, who's, who's making that, that claim. So in the law, all, all we have requires two. Jesus is saying, I am one. And then uh, verse 18, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So I am one witness, and my Father is the other. All, there we have two witnesses. So even in your law, Jesus is saying, you have two witnesses already. I am one, and my Father is one. Um, brings up a, an interesting reference that, that they, they then make. Verse 19, And so they were saying to him, Where is your father? Now, that simple question um, can have many um, possible meanings. And we have to be careful not to apply sarcasm to what somebody says. Jesus is not sarcastic when he says things. I think, I think the Apostle Paul is sometimes sarcastic <laughs> a few places. But Jesus is very, very straightforward, and his comments are, are true, and, and um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of any cases where I see any sarcasm. But I think within the Pharisees, we have to, there, there can be. But just because they say here, um, where is your father, you can ask that question, well, what are they really asking? Well, I'm going to jump ahead for a minute there, a minute here. Um, In, uh, and this is, again, jumping ahead a few verses, but which will be probably whoever um, speaks next week. In verse 41, Jesus says to them, you're the doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have a father, even God. So when I put these two statements together, and I go back here to verse 19, they says, um, where is your father? It does bring up the question, are they asking in this comment because they know the story of Mary? that when Mary and Joseph got married, Joseph is not the father? Do they know that? We don't know. We don't know how much detail they have here. But certainly if I look at verse um, 41, and they make this reference to fornication and stuff, it, they may be implying that you're an illegitimate son. Well, they're, they're, they don't understand who the father is. And that's, but, so there could be an honest question here, who, where's your father? Who are you talking about here? Or it could be a a little bit of sarcasm there. Yeah, well, you're not even worthy to be speaking to us because you don't even know who your father is. But the fact is, he does know who his father is. And that, that's what makes this so, so cool. Jesus responds to them, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. It's an interesting statement. If you know a person, and you know them really well, that doesn't mean you know who their father is. If I know a son and I know him real, really well, I, I don't necessarily know his father. If I know his father and I know him really well, I don't necessarily know the son, right? We, we know that in people that we know. We, in fact, you may know a family where you know, the father's great and the son's terrible or, the, or vice versa. So in a human perspective, just knowing the, the, the son does not give me in, information into the father necessarily or vice versa. It only makes sense if the father and the son are one, are one in essence, are one in everything that they do. So that if you know one, you know the other. And that's what Jesus is saying here. 
Um, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, if you knew that I was the son of God, you would know my father because you would know God. If you knew God, you would know me because I'm the son of God. Not a son as in an offspring, a son as in uh, uh, the, the like uh, fashion, the like um, in nature. He is God in the flesh. You know neither me nor my father. You don't know me or God. If you had known God, you'd know me. If you knew me, you'd know God. They're not making an effort to know Jesus. They're just judging him and condemning him for what he says instead of trying to know him. And they certainly, because of this, we see it clear, they don't know his father. They don't know God. Um, we see in John 14, verse 8, that the story where, where Philip says to Jesus, um, show, us, show us the father and that'll be enough. And Jesus' response to Philip is, have I been with you this long and you do not know me? I and my Father are one. So with that concept of the oneness of them, it now sheds light on this whole idea that if you knew Jesus, they would know God. If they knew God, they would know Jesus. But the fact that they're saying, who's your father, the fact that they don't know who his father is, shows they don't know who he is, and they don't know his father either. Verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not come. Verses like this, sometimes when you read them, it seems like it's, I don't want to say meaningless, but so what's the significance of his, of telling us where he was teaching from? He's in the temple, more specifically in the treasury. So what was the treasury for? What did they hold in the treasury? Um, Basically, it was the, the dedicated things, the things that had been set aside for God, the anointed things. Now, a lot of them were treasures. They put the gold and the silver and many of those things that were dedicated to God went into the treasury. Um, where are they all now, all those treasures that had been in the treasury? Well, the Egyptians took some of them. The Assyrians took some of them. The Babylonians took some of them. Perhaps the Romans took the rest. We don't know for sure. History we can see repeatedly throughout history where those dedicated things were taken away primarily because of the sin of the, of the people. They would turn their back away from God and those dedicated things that they had set aside for God would be taken away. And then some years later, it would happen again. So clearly they were able to put some more things back in there. They're dedicating them to God. These are our treasuries and they're taken away. So in this treasury right now, it's probably pretty empty, which is why Jesus is in there teaching. But what I love about this is the, the, the greatest treasure in the world is right now in the treasury, speaking to them, and they don't even know it. So they may be thinking of the fact of where they are. We used to have these great treasures, the golden shields that Solomon had built and these things that were that had been dedicated to God. They're all gone. But the anointed one of God is sitting right there teaching them from the treasury. I love that, that perspective. And then it ends by saying, no one seized him. His hour had not yet come. We have mentioned that a couple of times in, in preparation as we've come in through, the, through John, repeating that idea that his hour has not yet come. That's why nobody's taken him. They don't like him. They don't want him. We, we see it clearly that Jesus tells us, and, or John tells us through, through what Jesus says, that they want to kill him. Yet here he sits teaching, and they're not taking him away. Why aren't they taking him away? because it's not his time yet. His time is not for another six months until he goes to the cross. That's when they're going to be able to take him. It's not his time yet. He's preparing for that. He's, he's um, laying out the, the picture of who, of who he is, of who God is. And it come, it's going to culminate at the cross. But they don't, they don't see that. All, all we see from that perspective is they can't take him yet because it's not time. Verse 21, he said, therefore, again to them, I go away and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. You shall seek me. The Jews are seeking for a deliverer. They're looking for the Messiah. 
You shall seek me, Jesus says. You shall seek that Messiah. You are looking for the Messiah. You are looking for me. But you're not going to find me. I go away, and you shall seek me, and you shall die in your sins. They don't understand that, that this promised Messiah that they're looking for, who is going to deliver them, is there right now preparing to deliver them. They're thinking of a physical deliverance and not realizing that their greatest need for deliverance is the deliverance from sin. And the one who is able to forgive their sin and to pay the penalty for their sin is sitting before them preparing to do that. I go away and you shall seek me and you shall die in your sins. Why will they die in their sins? Because they rejected the one who is coming to pay the penalty for their sins. Without Jesus paying the penalty for their sins, they will die in their sins. What is the condemnation to them if they die in their sins, unforgiven? Eternity in hell. And that's the, Jesus is clearly making that point to them. I go away, and you're going to seek me, but you're going to die in your sins because you've rejected the forgiveness that, that, that comes from the Messiah. Where I am going, you cannot come. Where is he going? Well, he's going to the cross. They, they can't follow him there. But ultimately, he says, I am, well, he's going back to the Father. And they can't get there if they're relying on their, on their righteousness through the law. The law kills. In Christ, we have redemption. We have forgiveness of sins. We have eternal life. Verse 22, therefore, the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. The interesting response there. Why would they think that? Why would they think, is he going to kill himself? Josephus, one of the early um, uh, first century historians, shed some little light on that and some of the things that he teaches, teaches us about the Talmud and about the teachings of the, of the folks. The Jews believed, obviously, that they were going to heaven. They were God's chosen people. It doesn't matter. Almost from the perspective, it doesn't matter what we do, we're going to heaven. The Jewish leaders also believed that if somebody killed themselves, they were condemned to the darkest corner of hell. So if in their mind, I'm going to heaven, you're going someplace and I can't follow you there. The only place you must be going that I can't follow you is hell. So evidently they're thinking from the perspective that, well, if you're going to go to hell, you're going to have to kill yourself. That will condemn you there. So that's what appears the belief is that that's why they say that. Well, was he going to kill himself? We can't follow him. Um, one thing I think we need to, to say right off the bat there, um, okay, don't want to run ahead of my notes too far. I, I think the first thing I want to say in reference to that is the act of suicide does not condemn somebody to hell. People have been confused about that. We've had questions here at church about that before because people are concerned that somebody they knew that committed suicide, have they... Is that the unpardonable sin? Have they condemned themselves to hell? No. What is it that condemns us to hell? Unbelief. Unbelief. Is it possible that somebody can, can do something and, um, and, well, let me change that statement a little bit. All of us have committed sins that we don't even realize we've done. So it's not in the um, confession of sin that, we, that salvation is gained. It's in the belief of, of Jesus' death on the cross as the penalty for our sins that sins are paid for. We confess our sins um, and, and, and God cleanses us from them. He reveals them to us and we, we grow from that and, and out of love for him, we, we want to do those things that he wants us to do. But an individual sin does not condemn us to hell. If it, if it did, none of us would ever have any guarantee of eternal salvation because you can never know that you haven't made us some small sin right before you died. It was unconfessed. So we would all be condemned to eternity in hell. Belief in Jesus and, and, and his death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, past, present, and future, is what gives us eternal life. Amen. So a single sin, even one as bad as suicide, does not condemn somebody to eternity in hell. So their, their starting point of, of their comment is, is, is wrong. Because they're basing it on works. They're basing their salvation on works, or in their case, because, because I'm, I'm a Jew, um, I'm, we're righteous because God has chosen us. It's not based on works. It's not the act of an individual sin that condemns or, 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 does, or not. Um, in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. 
that's what we can rest assured on, that if I have given my faith and trust in, in, in Christ, no single sin is going to condemn me. However, I still need to, it's not a license to sin. Because if my attitude is one of, well, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm, I'm going to heaven anyways, I have to question the sincerity of that faith and that love of Jesus in the first place. Because it's out of love for Christ that we do what he's told us to do. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You will do what, what I told, tell you to do. In Psalms 19.2, I'm just going to jump there real quick. Relatively quick. No. Let's try Psalms 19, 12. 12. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. There's, there's, the psalmist recognizes that there are errors, there are faults in me that I don't even know I've done. Who can, who can acquit me of those things? Who can bring them to light and, and, and re redeem me from them? God can. So I don't know all the things that I've done. That just pointed to that idea that it's not because of what I, a, a particular sin or, 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 for, or confessed sin that gives us salvation. Um, if it was, none of us would have, have assurance of eternity. Verse 23. And he, he was saying to them, um, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Now Jesus is fully man. He is in this world. His human side was created in this world, but he's not, his beginning did not originate here. He is not from this world, but he is in this world. Um, I am not of this world. So is this a, is this a number ninth I am statement? Um, no, it's certainly, it's certainly encompassed within the, the eighth one where Jesus said, um, you know, before the father, before Abraham was, I am. And because he is God, he can say something like, I am not of this world. Because, because he's, he's of God. Verse 24. I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Going back to what he had just said, that they're going to die in their sins because they're rejecting him. And unless they believe in him, and what he's about to do, again, picturing the cross, what's coming ahead, his death and, and um, death on the cross that'll pay the penalty for their sins. Unless they believe that, they're going to die in their sins. Unless you believe that I am he, and that I am God. And so they were saying to him, who are you? Now, is that, who are you to say something like that? Or is it, who are you? We don't know. I think either way, it's a cha they're challenging. Um, where's my verse 24? Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know whether, uh, <laughs> part of me um, w would want to have, you know, when, when they say to Jesus, who are you, um, to respond, no one to be trifled with. Um, but only some of you who know Princess Bride would know the context of where that comes from. Um, but who are you can be taken a couple of different ways. And it can be taken of, um, you know, like I said, you know, who are you to say this to us? Or who are you? Because really, you've said some things, Jesus, that I don't understand. And I really want to know who you are. Um, so is it a real question? Well, I would say either way, it really does show the stubbornness of their hearts. Because he's told them repeatedly who he is and what he's, what he's come for. And they don't want to listen. Jesus said in verse 25, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I've already told you who I am. You're not listening. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. The things I have heard from God, these are what I'm saying. If that could be the, the words that we could say, the only thing I'm going to say to you is what I've heard from God. That would eliminate a lot of confusion, a lot of problems in the world, wouldn't it? If we were only sharing with our brothers the things that God has told us to share with our brothers and sisters. 
Verse 27, they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Jesus therefore said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. When you lift me up, speaks of the cross. The lifting up of Jesus on the cross and, and, and the death that's coming with that. But I also think it, it can have that kind of a reference to us as people, that when we lift up Jesus in worship to him, it helps us to understand and, and him better. That that act of worship leads to a deeper understanding, a deeper um, God's revelation to us of, of who he is. But at the cross is the proof of his godliness, as, as we see what, his, what he does when he goes through that whole process. The, the, one of the thieves that's beside him, we're not told about any dialogue that takes place between them, other than this thief watching and seeing what's going on and saying, and even the centurion says, uh, when Jesus died, he must, must have been, there goes, or must have been the son of God. But this thief just looks at him and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because the very act of what Jesus does on the cross is the proof of, of who he is. That, that, that only God could do that. Only God could, could go to a cross and the suffering that went with that and do it joyfully and, and not condemn and not, not lash back. But then even bigger is only God could go through that and then come back to life afterwards. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's my challenge this morning to myself. Can I say that I always do the things that are pleasing to God? I wish I could say that. That's the challenge then for all of us. What do I do to get me to the point where I can say that I always do the things that are pleasing to God? I read the scriptures, old and new, so I can better understand God, so I can know what it is that God says and does. I get to know the God of the scriptures. I get to know the Son of the, in the scriptures. And as I do that, I then learn what it, be, what it means to be um, doing those things that please him. If you don't know this God of forgiveness, if you don't know the joy of salvation, don't, don't leave here this morning without that knowledge, without that personal knowledge of, this, of the salvation that comes from, Je from Jesus' death on the cross. All that takes place here in John chapter 8, verses 12 through 30 that we're looking at is Jesus' focus on, on what's coming, on, on his death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And we don't want to miss that whole thing as we go through this. Thank you for your attention this, attention this morning. And I would repeat the same thing to anybody online. If there's something about you know, you don't have this joy of salvation. You don't know this God that we talk about, this Jesus who died for the pen penalty, to pay the penalty of your sins. Um, contact us online. We'll get back to you. Okay, thank you.
Sorry to keep you waiting. <laughs> Sorry. We had a good rehearsal Thursday night, but you know, there's always some last minute things here. But uh, our goal is to help you to worship through music. So won't you join us for our last song? just sang about your mercy and that your power and light is stronger than darkness. We love you and we thank you for being the light of the world. Thank you, Lord, for this time of learning, worship, and fellowship. Help us to continue to get to know you and do things that please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.